Well, and speaking of trying to assign blame, it wasn't just about saying that our allies decided to cut into our votes or to say that, you know, the people did not make the right choice. A very strange narrative was also introduced into how the results were being read. Why? Because the three states in the north, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan decided to put the BJP in power. But the one state that the Congress did manage to win was in the south, Telangana. So suddenly you had this entire narrative about how voters in the north were not mature enough, that they were saffronized, that they were right-wingers, or as some people decided to call them, they were the Hindis, as opposed to the voters of the South, voters of Karnataka, voters of Telangana, and earlier, voters of states like Tamil Nadu and Kerala, who are the more mature, more sensible, more secular voters, and they are making the right choice in going for the Congress. The thing is, is this again a sign of how the real malaise and the problem is being ignored in order to blame the voter himself. What does he make of this entire North versus South debate that is currently happening? Joining us is Jay Sai Deepak, advocate and author. Thanks very much, Sai, for speaking to us. So what do you make of this argument that the North is now BJP dominated and the South is more accommodative of parties like the Congress? No, I think it's an artificial and a malicious and a politically motivated distinction, which I think is meant to sow the seeds of balkanization of Bharat on uh, pseudo-ethnocentric lines. And I think this needs to be countered as soon as possible. Uh, according to me, this takes forward the same missionary uh, template that was employed in the 18th and the 19th century to cleave the culture between Bharat, uh, the north of Bharat and the south of Bharat. And uh, I, I, I can say this with a fair degree of confidence, having read the literature carefully and deeply, that this is, um, according to me, Dravidianist expansionism from the south to the north in terms of their ideological presence. But isn't it a fact that barring Himachal Pradesh, at present, no state has a Congress government. All of them have decided to go to the BJP. But the same people, the same party managed to win Karnataka and then Telangana. See, the fact is that detail misses an important, uh, uh, let's say, aspect of the outcome, which is the rapid increase in the BJP's vote share in the South. And I'm saying this as a non-expert, let's say, observer of these aspects or of these developments. The kind of victory that BJP has seen in, in Telangana, I think, on the ground needs to be seen to be believed. And if anybody witnesses the kind of crowds uh, Sri Annamalai draws in Tamil Nadu, I would ask myself a simple question, what is the difference between the Hindi heartland, so to speak, or the so pejoratively called cow belt, and those parts of Tamil Nadu that have embraced Annamalai? So I think this is a binary which has no basis in reality. Is the voter in the north more right of centre and the voters in the south more left of centre or completely left in the case of Kerala? Because empirically, that's what it looks like if you were to look at which party is in power in which state? See, I think it would be a historic to contend that Hindutva has not had an origin uh, in the north of Vindhyas in terms of its historical origin, so to speak, or the way the movement has started. But to say that its appeal is limited only to the north of India, I'm sorry to say, is completely baseless. It has no basis whatsoever. BJP has occupied power in uh, Karnataka at least since 2008 more than once. And in Mysore and, and coastal Karnataka, so to speak, these are what are called saffron strongholds or saffron, or saffron bastions. So I don't think this argument makes sense whatsoever. And second, to say that people in the north are interested only in religion, they have nothing to do with language, they have nothing to do with culture, they have nothing to do with development. No, it doesn't make sense whatsoever. Anybody who visits the Pradesh today will know for a fact that civilization and development go hand in hand. Sanskriti and Vikas go hand in hand in places like Uttar Pradesh. So the, this argument, I, I don't think it, uh, holds any water. Then what do you make of Maharashtra? So where do states like Maharashtra survive? Maharashtra and Gujarat are supposed to be not simply because they are above India's, but for all practical purposes, they are the, the, they are the west of India. They are not the Hindi heartland. They are not the cow belt. What do you make of those states? Sure, but, <laughs> so I don't think that makes sense whatsoever. Sure, but then how do you square off the irony of the RSS having the maximum shakhas in Kerala, despite that Hindus, even the Hindus in Kerala, vote for the communists? 
because I don't think the BJP has managed to present a credible face which can actually reach out to the voters, uh, particularly in a deeply religious state such as Kerala. That's a fact. And second, Kerala and Bengal almost mirror each other in the harsh realities of how battles are won, political battles are won in the streets or on the streets. So the presence of a Hindu vote base does not translate to, let's say, electoral victory, unless you're able to project someone who can confidently inspire them to come out and vote for them. Because if you don't present that face, there are repercussions and there are, let's say, implications and consequences which have to be faced immediately, the way you saw in Bengal post-2021 election results. Now, I want to address the elephant in the room because, uh, you know, through this entire uh, story that we see on social media by some politicians, the insinuation actually is this. When you say that, oh, you know, North Indian voters are saffronized, the insinuation is that, that those who are in the North are Islamophobic, hence they vote for the BJP. But those in the South are more communally, uh, you know, they're more secular, they're more communally amiable. Hence, they are rejecting the BJP's brand of politics and the Congress's mohabbat ki dukaan, as it were. So what do they make of BJP's success in the old city of Hyderabad in the Telangana elections this time? In places which are heavily Muslim-dominated, where, uh, let's say, people like Raja Singh and his uh, colleagues have succeeded significantly in areas like Bahadurpur and whatnot. What do you make of that success? I don't, I don't, I don't think people have actually read the history of the Ramjanam Bhumi to understand how much of contribution, both in terms of men and material, was made by the South to the construction of, of the Ram Mandir in the, in the mid-90s and the early 90s. That as someone who's lived or who's, who's, who hails from Hyderabad and who's lived in those tumultuous years, I know exactly how serious this issue was. So uh, any keen student of history will tell you that to say that the Hindu wave is limited to only the upper parts of Bharat and has nothing to do with the South, sorry, you just have to attend speeches by Yogi Ji delivered in the South and you will know what kind of uh, a reson uh, let's say resonance it has with members of the South. I don't deny that the BJP's presence in the North and the South are different, they are disparate. But that does not mean that there is no possibility of a saffron wave in the South. It's a matter of time. I don't think they have invested all these years enough. They have started and I hope they do better and they actually start providing credible faces. Karnataka, according to me, is a case of several missed opportunities and not the presence of a saffron establishment or a saffron foundation. It does have a saffron foundation and I hope they regain it and they reclaim it. You know, uh... The entire North versus South divide, uh, especially after the advent of dividend politics, has, you know, Hindi versus Tamil, etc., has, has existed for a very long time. And now, electorally, it has also become a theme. Uh, the Prime Minister tried to bridge this gap uh, when he travels to Tamil Nadu. The Kashi and Saurashtra Tamil Sangamam are also interesting experiments. Uh, will that help in the saffron march into the South, as it were? More than anything else, I would see that as a march of Bharat, because these speak of civilizational unity. What is extremely crucial as part of this discussion is the attempt of a sore loser to try and divide Bharat on linguistic lines and on cultural lines, and the attempt of another party to take the country together along as a single civilizational and political unit. When people in power or people out of power play let's say, play games with the fabric of the country in terms of its unity, in terms of its integrity, civilizational integrity more than political integrity, I think it speaks volumes of the kind of irresponsible behavior they're capable of resorting to. It's a scotched earth policy, according to me. So I believe that the initiatives of the BJP in trying to forge unity between the so-called divided North and the South has to be supported, not in the interest of the BJP's political victory, but because it matters for Bharat. In this entire debate of North versus South and uh, the supposed divide, what effect, if any, will the opening of the Ram Temple have? What happens on the 22nd of January? Huge. I think it's huge. But as someone who is a believer in Sri Ram, I hope that the institution, that the temple is not reduced to a political tokenage and symbolism. It means much more than that because the Ram Janabhumi movement uh, out uh, let's say it's it's been around for at least 500 years much before the rss or the bjp or the vhp or anybody came into existence so that movement is not 
uh, any movement that any particular party or organization can appropriate. It is a Hindu movement. It is a people's movement. It is, in, in that sense, a Republican movement of a civilization that has been long suppressed. And I hope that with the, the opening of the Ram Janabhumi or the Ram Mandir, so to speak, it will herald a new uh, uh, era of confidence. I don't mean domination. I'm not for domination. I'm certainly saying of clear, confident, composed assertiveness and the fact that it could pave the way for further reclamations of similarly occupied places. Well, irrespective of uh, political benefits to anyone, just the entire idea of talking about North versus South and how one region of the country is uh, antithetical to the idea of secularism, that in itself is against the idea of nationalism and treating the country as a whole. Hopefully, this kind of discourse should meet an early end. Dear Saitipak, thanks very much for speaking to us. Thanks for watching.